And once again, we are well, we are back here in living in the 21st century. Joining me today is Adrian K. Relaford, M.E.D.B.A., with over 20 years in the social services services field. Currently, she is a family service specialist with the North East Region Department of Children's and Families Circuit 4. She serves as the right hand to the program administrator. She's a certified child protective investigator in the state of Florida. She was selected as part of the critical injury and death unit for the Florida Department of Children and Families. She resides in Jackson, Florida, Florida, Jacksonville, Florida. Sorry. Then we have Mr. Steve Jones, executive officer of the school improvement on, in Bibb County School District located in Macon, Georgia. Mr. Jones is the owner of Push and Leadership LLC. His company focuses on building the capacity and removing barriers for educational leaders in the area of school improvement. We also have Takara Figueroa. She is a certified family nurse practitioner from Richmond, Virginia. She works with COVID-19 patients. Then Pastor Avery Hudson, 11-year teacher at Clayton County Public Schools, as well as a parent community liaison in Atlanta, Georgia. He's also the leader, past, lead pastor of Church, Christ Church, of sorry, of Christ Deliverance Temple, the Life Center in Columbus, Georgia. He is sought after conference speaker, revivalist, and motivational orator. He has positively reinforced belief that our full potential is only truly realized when we live a life of service for others. And finally is Dr. Cheryl Clayton Molina, founder of Turnaround Vision, LLC, a retiree from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, certified life coach and motivational speaker, and a GED instructor in Augusta, Georgia. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you all for joining me today here on Living in the 21st Century. And my first question goes out to Adrienne Relaford. Now, Adrienne, um, you have a lot going for you um, in the state of Florida. My question to you, in a time where there's so much virus going on and schools are going through some of the most rigid times they can possibly think about, parents on one side, the school on the other, the kids in the middle, could you explain what's really going on there in Florida, please? Mm. Okay, well, greetings from the Sunshine State. Um, I am in Duval County. I, I our county, but we're part of the Northeast region, which covers seven counties in Florida. Those counties are Duval County, Nassau County, Baker County, Clay County, St. John's County, Putnam County, and Flagler County. But Duval is one of the major ones that I serve. Um, what I see is increased in domestic violence cases, substance abuse cases, and the out-of-home placement. So when I look back for the total year of 2020, um, Duval County, where the Northeast region had a total of 13,367 cases, of which 8,664 belonged to Duval County. Um, it was a lot of disruption. When you picture it, you have a family, mom, dad, and we'll just say two children or maybe three. Mom goes to work, dad goes to work. Children go to school. So in that period, the reality is some people look at this as a respite period. This is a time where I get a break from mommy, 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 mommy. Can you, can I, can I, and honey, 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 can you do this and can you do that? Now, couple that with the pandemic. And then now we're home and we're having to quarantine together. So that adjustment period became chaotic. And at that point, now what you don't know is the home was already volatile. It was already a hostile situation and a violent situation. So now we're having the survivors of DV having to quarantine with their abuser. And so now everything is out of order. Then nobody's working. Nobody have money for food. Nobody have money to pay the rent, the utilities or anything of that nature. So tempers flare. In fact, we did see an increase in um, domestic violence cases. On an average, the Department of Children and Families would refer 30, at least 30 referrals monthly to our Hubbard House 
subsidiary. And now we're up to 96 per month. So that gives you a total of an additional 36 with uh, 60% if you want to look at it percentage wise of increase of referrals due to domestic violence. So with everything else is going on, then you want to look at an uptick. If I can, I can share my screen to sure. show you sure. here. When you look at the domestic violence cases, when the pandemic first hit March of 20, 2020, Duval County is in the blue. The Northeast region is in the orange. You see, it was 159 domestic violence cases in the month of March. But as the pandemic, pandemic progressed, by the time August, September, you see a rise from 159 to 217 cases. Um, in September and October, 221. November, we're up to 230. December, we had a decrease because everybody is in love in December. It's Christmas time. It's the holidays. Everybody's getting along. But then coming to January, we're back up. Now, I want to point out, if you look, as the vaccination begins to happen and people are basically, quote, outside again, you see where there was a decline in those cases, even after up to Ju um, July 2021. So there was a significant increase, especially and that was the period and when people were starting to come into the knowledge of being vaccinated. So here, just wanted to show a little proof of how the cases went, the uptick or the splurge of cases that the department began to see um, with domestic violence cases. Right. And then there was another area as far as um, substance misuse. Um, you got this out time, people are smoking marijuana, but now the opioid crisis is, is taking over. And now they're experimenting with synthetic drugs, such as Molly, such as Flocka, such as K2 Spice. They also have um, the bath salts. So it is my professional opinion that the COVID-19 played a part in this because I want to take you back that to a graph in just a minute, but many people suffer with depression. So that was their way of coping with the COVID-19, having to be quarantined, having to can't see their family, having to be inside, jobs closing down, they can't work, especially when you're into um, the food industry. A lot of restaurants did close in Jacksonville, especially on the beach, um, in the beach area, Jacksonville Beach, Neptune Beach, those areas did close. So that put a lot of hardship on the family. So now you're dealing with self-medicating and okay. because I'm depressed. So we saw a rise in alcoholism. We saw a rise with the drugs. So I'm going to use my substance exposed newborn as my variable when I talk about substance misuse to show how it increased. Um, as of March 2020, Duval County received 23 intakes alleging babies substance exposed newborn. That was March 2020. Now, nine months to birth the baby, when you bring it up to December 2020, it increased from 23 intakes okay. to 47, which okay. is a significantly increase okay. with, um, with that. Right. Um, I want to move on here uh, quickly because the time is going along. Um, I want to ask uh, Mr. Steve Jones this question, and I will get back to you, Adrian, on the governor and what he is doing pertaining to this matter in Florida. Because I'm quite sure he's very, very knowledgeable of what's going on. But I just want to move on briefly to um, Mr. Steve Jones. Um, Steve, uh, Mr. Jones, tell me, you, you are one of the leaders in education in the area of, um, in, back in Georgia, how is the virus presently affecting kids um, who may be homeschooled at this juncture, um, not being able to get back in that social setting that they once knew? What's going on there? Good morning, everyone. And uh, Good morning. Thank, you, thank you for having me on this morning. Sure. As you stated, um, 
it the impact of COVID. Uh, I don't. I don't think. But well, I know none of us ever would have thought that we would have seen anything like this happen uh, during our lifetime. I can tell you, it's had a tremendous impact. And you know, I know a lot of times we talk about the impact on students. However, we also have to talk about the impact on staff as well. Staff members, the adults, the adults are the are the primary teachers are the primary resources for ensuring that students are getting what they need. And so when you think about the impact of of um, students being at home, I, I, I kind of liken it to this. In, in education, the best educators are those that have rapport and those that have relationships with kids. And so when you think about building rapport and building relationships, think about your close family members and friends. You can text a friend every day. You can call a friend every day. You can write letters every day. But when they come face to face with you, at the moment that they come face to face, it's a totally different type of interaction. And it's the same thing with our students. Our students that are at home, and I, and I, I want to say this first, every student is not struggling that's at home. Some students have adapted to it and they're able to move through it. But I, I, have, a, I have a strong concern for those that are at home and when we talk about an equitable access, accessible education, some students don't have an, it's not an equitable education for all students when they are at home because they need that face-to-face -face interaction. It is totally different when in the presence of, their, of their, their teachers. For a lot of students, school is the safe place. And when I think about what Dr. Um, Dr. Uh, Relford just talked about, you think about this. She talked about it from the adult issue but when you think about the child who's carrying that load, that invisible backpack with the weight of the world on their shoulders, and they're sitting at home and they're having to cope with that while still listening to online instruction. And in some instances, if it's asynchronous, it's, there's not a live teacher, it causes a tremendous decrease in acceleration for students uh, academically. Students are not able to grasp the concepts uh, the way they need. And in education, a lot of times we talk about giving students things in suitable steps to challenge them in a suitable step and then to be able to uh, to differentiate learning for them. It is very, very difficult. Now, we're working on that right now. And I think that educators across the world are going to get it together. But the the big deal for those kids sitting at home is their social and emotional well-being. Uh, and I think that's going to have a long term impact uh, on students. So um, as I guess to kind of, kind of summarize all of that, I think it's important that students are in school, uh, in the presence of teachers, uh, that we do what we need to do to get those students where they need to be. Uh, right now, uh, so many students are struggling, so many students are suffering. Great. Um, and, and definitely want to hold you on that one because I'm going to get back to you with that, considering the uptick in the virus and having children, kids back at school, in some cases where they are not taking the necessary safety precaution simply because their parents don't, doesn't want them to wear masks. But I want to move on briefly to um, Takara uh, Figueroa. Um, Takara, you are a certified nurse practitioner um, in Virginia and you work with COVID patients. I want you to explain some of the realities to those who may think that the virus is just nothing more but a conspiracy theory, and it is not what it really is. Um, could you briefly explain some of the realities to that? Absolutely. Good morning. Thank you for having me today. Sure. Um, COVID-19 is not your common cold, although the coronaviruses have been around for many years, and in years past, they have caused common cold-like symptoms. However, the mutated form, COVID-19 and the new Delta variant um, cause much more serious um, illnesses. So you will get flu-like symptoms, the aches, the fever, the chills, things of that nature. But how the coronavirus is designed is it attacks the lungs and it causes inflammation in your lungs and that impedes the lungs ability to um, allow you to breathe out CO2 and breathe in oxygen. Um, that causes a whole realm of issues, shortness of breath, um, pneumonia, 
life threatening uh, upper respiratory diseases. So it, it is not your common cold. It's not a hoax. It, it's not, oh, it's just a, a worser form of the flu, so to speak. Um, it's, it's very, very serious. And it can have very detrimental effects. Okay. And, and as a nurse, I believe you would have actually witnessed people dying in your, um, in your presence. Yes. You um, I've worked in the ICU. I've worked in the emergency room. And currently I'm working at a family practice. And I have seen individuals 16 on ventilators struggling for their life, struggling to breathe because they contracted the disease. And unfortunately, our youth, um, they don't really understand the ramifications of staying safe. They have this Superman ideology to where they feel like nothing can stop me, nothing can harm me, or even it won't happen to me. But it can happen to you. It very well can. And in your, and it, appear, it, it appears to be a very horrible way to, to die with this separation. Absolutely. Imagine um, laying in a bed and a pillow is over your face and you're trying to breathe. Okay. That, that is the realization of what COVID could be for you. Great. Well, I'm, I'm going to get back on the second half to you and that because there are a lot of people, not only here in the U.S., but in the Caribbean region also, who think that this virus is just something not to take serious. And in the result of that, they are not taking vaccines. And my next question goes out to Pastor Avery Hedgson, uh, who is also a teacher at Clayton County Public Schools. Um, Pastor, tell me something. In your presence right now, um, how do you see families getting along and managing through this virus? Those kids who probably stuck at home, um, the parents who also may be at home or working from home or having to go out not knowing if they're bringing the virus back where the kids can catch it. What are the struggles um, to what you're witnessing right now? Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a difficult struggle. Uh, in fact, um, at this particular junction, I work as a parent liaison at Clayton County Public Schools. So my primary job is to work with parents. And so um, that and combined in conjunction with what I do uh, on a ministerial level, this pandemic has been uh, horrific for families. The separation is difficult, um, as everyone has stated. Uh, in addition, uh, I had a parent who called me the other day because she wanted uh, the school to know that her child was uh, in the children's hospital, and that she wanted to keep that connection to just to let the teachers know that her child was not just missing school, but that she was in fact sick. Um, it is a difficult time for us as a whole. And I think what it is, is finding a coping mechanism. Many families don't have uh, uh, the closeness that we used to have. I will say that uh, social media and uh, these different entities have separated us as well as though it was a form that it should have connected us there's so much separation and division. And so I think the virus has added to that and uh, 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 an uh, astronomical amount added to that weight. So what we have to do is we have to find a connection, we have to find a, connect, uh, a link. Uh, I can agree with Mr. Jones about wanting students to be in the work environment. We have to find a, a healthy medium so that we are not spreading this virus as well as we're not sending it home. It's not just uh, 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 the, the parents that worry about that. I worry about that myself. Uh, I have a, a 10 month old son. My wife um, uh, works as a phlebotomist in the hospital. And so those are things that, you know, we battle every day. Me working in a school environment and she working in a hospital setting and bringing it home to our 10 month old son. So I think that's a, a conundrum for families as a whole. Uh, and so that is something that we're seeing across the board. Like I said, not only in my church congregation, there are different steps that we do and even uh, uh, different levels in, of, 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 of uh, protection that I can do at the church. 
that I can't necessarily do at, at, at my at school. And so those are the things that we battle with uh, uh, as a whole. But what we do is we try to find um, a medium or try to find a coping mechanism uh, as a community and, and reconnect families and reconnect friends and reconnect the, the sense of hope. That's what more than anything, we want to uh, um, push hope or let, even when it comes down to vaccinations, you know, a lot of people, you know, on a spiritual level or on the fence about vaccination. I, I, I have to personally say that I see the vaccination as a way of, as a sense of hope. And so uh, that's what we want to push hope today. Briefly, for those who are struggling with these spiritual beliefs, um, there are those who believe that if they are a Christian, that this virus will not have an impact on their bodies and they can very well go to church. And in some cases, some of them go to church unprotected. Um, how do you nourish or divert the attention of those who strongly believe because they are a Christian, they cannot be hurt in a virus that doesn't discriminate among anyone? Uh, briefly. Well, the, first, the first thing I tell people is that the scripture says he, have, he would not have us to be ignorant. Mm -hmm. Now, and I'm saying this, that faith is not a blanket statement that, you know, we, we are going to be protected. In fact, the Bible says that the okay. weapon okay. formed against us would not prosper. But okay. it did not say that the weapon wouldn't be formed. Right. Right. Excellent. Um, Dr. Molino, um, I, I'm, I'm here at you now. <laughs> um, I know you've witnessed a lot in your life, and there are those you would mentor and, and give structure to this style of living. We are living in a very confused world today, politically, socially, culturally, and it is a time where people need to understand that this virus is real, and it only becomes real to those who sometimes when they find themselves in the hospital bed, crying for their life. What word of comfort would you want to say to the people that, look, hey, this thing is real. We need to face facts. We need to be vaccinated. Um, how would you go about um, dealing with a matter like that? Well, first thing, COVID-19 has become a part of our everyday vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Everywhere you go, it doesn't matter what state you go to. It doesn't matter what country you go to. COVID-19 is present. Um, and it has caused a lot of changes in our lives. Just last year, you remember when COVID first came about, what did it do? It had us rush into the store, buying masks, buying Lysol. COVID has changed America. This is worldwide. It's just not local. It's worldwide. Are we going back to normal? Is there any such thing as being normal again? I believe that we're gonna have to find a way to cope with it. COVID has caused anxiety, anger, frustration. Even I had a client to tell me just last month, Dr. Molina, I feel numb. I, I feel like this is just, this just cannot be real, but it's real. And we have to find a way to cope with it. You know, when COVID first came about, every day, day in and day out, I was at a time, I would spend my time looking at the news, COVID, 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 COVID. But it didn't get to the point where you have to relieve yourself of that. You have to back away from the television, back away from social media, and just listen to it. Maybe we have to stay informed as to what's going on. But then maybe just narrow it down to two times a day instead of constantly listening at COVID, COVID, COVID. You have to take a break because it can become upsetting. How do we cope with it? Again, back away from, from the media a little bit because there's so much, so many stories out there, so many misformed information. A lot of it is not true, a lot of it is true. But, um, and family and friends, you know, we got to the point last year and I lost my father to COVID and we was not able to go to the hospital to see him and he died from it. And that was, that was hurting. Yes. But we have to learn how to go from grieving 
to healing? And that was one of the questions I had for Mr. Hudson. How did we go from grief, grieving to healing? Because I was reading just yesterday that a lot of people are since the COVID has find, uh, become Christians. They're trying to find a way out. And they nice. just... They're looking for an answer. We need <laughs> a way true. out. That's true. Well, well um, we're going to start. We will return to the second half of this show when we return. And Adrian, I would love to ask you a next question pertaining to domestic violence. So please hold on for the next half and we'll be connecting pretty shortly. <laughs> 